Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12944 in the name of Natalie Don on Children Care and Justice Scotland Bill at Stage 3. As members will be aware, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in her view, any provision of a bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in the presiding officer's view, no provision of the Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority be, to be passed at stage three. We will now move on to the debate. I would invite members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Minister Natalie Don to speak to and to move the motion. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Presiding officer, should Parliament agree to the Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill today, Scotland will be taking a significant step forward in embedding UNCRC principles and keeping the promise. The bill before us today will ensure children in Scotland are kept out of young offenders institutions and it will support safe, proven, care-based alternatives. The bill will enable children of all ages to be referred to the principal reporter so that they can access the protective framework of the hearing system. Despite a youth justice emphasis dominating our bill discussions, we must emphasise that most children who need compulsory care are due to welfare reasons rather than for offending. The bill also provides a robust package of support for victims and their families, strengthened at stage two and in yesterday's stage three session. The bill will also make improvements for children involved in the criminal justice system, provide a better remittal framework between courts and hearings, and strengthen measures around secure and residential care, including secure transport, and allow us to further regulate cross-border placements. Now, those who have followed this bill's progress will know that it received a lot of attention at Stage 2. Over 220 amendments were considered in detail by the Education, Children and Young People Committee. Of course, that is not surprising. The bill is wide-ranging and the reforms evoke strong reactions and the proposals are technical and intricate. But I thank and commend the committee for its work, long hours and diligent consideration. And I would also like to thank the stakeholders who gave committee evidence and shared their views to help shape this legislation. I also thank other members across all parties who have undertaken in-depth engagement and worked with me over stages two and three. I believe the bill, as we have it before us this afternoon, demonstrates what can be achieved when goodwill is there. Presiding officer, there has been a lot of discussion around this bill's measures to support victims. This government is committed to supporting victims, especially child victims and their families, no matter which system, the hearing system or the criminal justice system, deals with an offence case. As members know, children's hearings are about protecting and supporting children. They are not an adversarial or retributive system like the criminal courts. And we've opened up that system to the extent that we can, while respecting child rights and confidentiality constraints. The bill, as strengthened yesterday, now strikes this balance. Willie Rennie's amendments agreed yesterday, on which I was delighted to work with him, will introduce a new national single point of contact support service for victims and certain members of their families. The bill also enables the principal reporter to share information for safety planning purposes, not just when compulsory measures or movement of restriction conditions are in place. Overall, the bill will deliver a much improved support and information package for victims without putting at risk the nature of the hearing system. Presiding officer, the children's hearing system, secure accommodation and other services already support many 16 and 17 year olds. However, reforms to allow all under 18s access to the children's hearing system have been a long time coming. These were consulted on back in 2020, again by the committee's call for views, and it's heartening to see provisions now coming before the Chamber today. The integrated, welfare-based Kilbrandon ethos of our children's hearing system is something that Scotland can rightly take pride in. All children, whether in need, at risk or in trouble, deserve our concern and support, and this bill will help ensure that they get it. 
Parliament will be aware that the original bill timetable was extended last autumn to allow the Leeds Committee to consider updated figures and costs. Among other issues, members raised concerns about children's panel capacity to accommodate more children. And I repeat my assurances, to, assurances today that provisions will not be commenced until systems and services are ready. Commencement plans will be co-produced with partners. An implementation and resourcing group comprising delivery agencies and a wide range of stakeholders continues to meet and is already undertaking preparatory work in anticipation of this legislation. Presiding officer, Scotland should not be imprisoning children. This position is firmly rooted in the UNCRC. It is a key precept of keeping the promise and it is a principle endorsed at stage one by the Leeds Committee's report and by this Parliament. It is also a principle on which we are delivering. The number of children in young offenders institutions has dropped from 16 in 21-22 to 7 in the latest figures. In fact, at the turn of the year, the figure was as low as one child. This bill now ensures that no children will go to young offenders institutions. And in line with our commitment to keep the promise, our intention is to commence those particular provisions later this year. That will, of course, require secure accommodation capacity in more cases. I have listened to carefully to views and to concerns throughout parliamentary scrutiny. Members can be reassured that providers, inspectors, local authorities and researchers have faith that Scotland's highly rated secure accommodation services can care safely for all our under-18s who need that specialist support. Secure accommodation services confirmed to committee their track records in caring for Scotland's young people, most in need or at risk, and their readiness to accommodate this change. On legal aid, there was a spirited and well-intentioned debate on this yesterday, and I'd like to reiterate to Ms Duncan Glancy that for jointly reported cases, legislation is not required in this bill. Regulations are under active consideration, and again, I'm more than happy to continue to engage with her on that. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention on that point, but during the discussions between Stage 2 and Stage 3, the Minister did not only say that regulations were under consideration, the Minister gave me assurances that regulations would be brought. Those assurances are necessary to bring the bill in line with the UNCRC Article 40. And so can the Government take the opportunity now to put on the record that that will be the case and explain why they were not prepared to put it in the bill yesterday? Minister. As I said during Stage 2 and Stage 3, that I did not feel that on the face of the bill was required, but those regulations were underway, and I have emphasised again throughout this process that I am more than happy to work with the member on that, because I see the importance in that in relation to this bill. Presiding officer, this bill provides improvements in many other significant areas. Now, time precludes my covering them all here, but they include measures on secure transport, improvements to court procedures involving children, and powers to strengthen the regulatory framework around cross-border placements. All have the interests of children at their heart. Presiding officer, should this bill be agreed, it will make significant improvements to children's rights, experiences, and outcomes. Accordingly, I move that the Parliament agrees that the Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Ros McCall. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. My youngest daughter came to live with us when she was two years old. She was three months old when the decision was made that she was no longer safe to stay in the environment she was living in and she was moved to the first of her foster families. When she was 18 years old, she requested her files. These folders are half of the information pertaining to her. The other files are still held within social services as they have too, many, too much information on others, so therefore providing her with a copy is impossible. There are thousands upon thousands of sheets of paper within these files. And remember, these documents are primarily about a child who was taken into care when she was two. It took a team of social workers over a year to compile these for her. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring any files in regarding my eldest daughter, because currently social services do not have the capacity to pull together those files for her. 
Of the six files that relate to my daughter who was two, I can only imagine the reams of paper and documents that would need to be compiled for someone who came to live with us at the age of five. It's certainly too much of a time constraint on our already overstretched so-called social workers. Social work is the first service to be blamed by society when abuse of a child goes unnoticed, but it's also the first service to be forgotten when everything is going well. They look after every vulnerable person regardless of age within our society. They are under-resourced, over-utilised and stretched further than we in this place accept or understand. And they are the linchpin for everything we're trying to do. Presiding officer, I'm sure you're asking yourself what on earth has this got to do with what we've got in front of us. And it's already been agreed that the Children's Care and Justice Bill is primarily about adding two years, 16 and 17, to the existing system of children's hearing panel. No one in this chamber disputes that premise or goal. That's why we voted for it at stage one. No one wants to see children in jail. And any suggestion of that is a political spin of the most opportunist kind. The issue isn't about the direction of travel. The issue is over the way we get there and how it's resourced. The bill in its current form is predicated on the first principle that everything within the current system is working and unfortunately it's not. The children's hearing panel has to upscale. It needs to embark on a massive recruitment drive of volunteers and the government needs to set out in more detail, well, I think anyway, how it will proceed with the proposals from the Mackey Review so that this is done in as smooth a process as possible. And I think that should have been done before this bill becomes law. We need hundreds more social workers. We have difficulty retaining the ones we have, never even mind recruiting more. The government needs to look at the role of social workers and the conditions we're asking them to operate. Find out why we have a retention problem and fix it. And this should be addressed before the bill becomes law. We are in need of more foster carers. The latest Care Expectorate report saying in 2022 there are fewer new households approved than in any other of the four preceding years and that 402 foster care households deregistered. Now they support our social work. And uh, yes, I will take an intervention. Ruth thank McGuire. I, I thank Rose McCall for, for, for giving way and I, I acknowledge all the, the challenges that she's laying out, but the bill in front of us today has the purpose of keeping children out of prison. I, I'm interested, are, are you going to vote against this bill? Rose McCall, and through the chair, please. I think there is, sorry, thank you very much indeed for the intervention. I am looking at how this bill will be in, in reality and I don't think we'll be able to support it with the issues that are coming forward. I the right to uh, foster families, the support social work and can assure that children who need respite care are suitably homed and not relying on residential care facilities. And this should have been addressed before the bill becomes law. Now the Education Committee produced an excellent report and I commend the committee and their hard work. But it must be said that the committee highlighted concerns over the sequencing of the bill. These issues are not new, they've not been properly addressed, and assurances that this will all be sorted out, I'm sorry, is not good enough. They should have been addressed before the bill passes, as I'm sure it will today. And that's a big worry, that we might find ourselves in the position where, for all the good intentions and for all the warm words, the support from children's groups, the system will simply not cope and it will be children that are let down. And where do the victims come in this? Many of them are children themselves. The current judicial system for 16 and 17 year olds, for all its flaws, at least has it enshrined that the rights of the victim must be upheld. We know from cases supplied by ASSIST that the current system, through the children's panel process, does not support those rights. And it leaves victims of abuse open, unable to access the risk they find themselves in, unable to get the relevant information to keep themselves safe. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I want to see a Scotland where the children can be properly supported and the agreements of the aims of the bill are not in dispute. I want a properly funded, fully resourced and supported teams of childcare professionals. Unfortunately, with so many things brought forward by this government, the foundation is simply not there. The risks that enacting the bill will falter and are still too prevalent. Victims, particularly young victims' rights, are not as supported. And the pattern of law may continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCall. I now call Martin Whitfield. Around five minutes, please. 
I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to open this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour and indeed to be involved in the passage um, of this bill at many of its stages, because nothing, nothing is more important to our society than caring for the safety and well-being of our children and young people. I know this as a former primary school teacher. I know this as a parent. I hope people know it as being human beings. We have an absolute obligation to support our next generation because it is into the world we give them that they have to grow. But the sad truth is that in too many ways, Scotland's young people are still being failed. This bill came with so much promise. This bill came with so many good intentions. This bill came with a goal that I think it is hard and indeed to echo the previous contribution, it was hard for anyone to disagree with. The shame is where we are now with the bill that's confronted before us. We support, Scottish Labour support young people and that also means that Scottish Labour supports those professionals, those adults, those experts, those charities, those groups, those families that stand around our young people and children. No one wants to see a young person end up losing their liberty. It is a failing of what surrounds them when that happens. And we need to ensure that the journey and experience when that does occur is the very best for that young person, because that removal of liberty, that interaction with a judicial and child hearing system is actually a failure of what's gone before. In the short time that I have, I want to pick up um, one element in respect of what happened with regard to stage three, and I, 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 no doubt this will not come as a shock to the Minister or indeed the Cabinet Secretary who is, who is here today. Um, and that is in relation to the amendment that was posed with regard to the UNCRC. And we heard in the Minister's opening again the very powerful rhetoric that we believe in children's rights, we believe in human rights, we believe that the UNCRC should underpin decision making. Indeed, if we were only a few months from now, along with the statement that you made at the start about the presiding officer's decision, there would potentially have been a statement about compliance with the UNCRC. All of this is welcome. But I go back to the quote that I put into the Stage 3 amendment yesterday from the First Minister about the dangers of bringing substantial amendments that cause significant impact in legislation being lodged at Stage 3. Because to do so, which is what we saw yesterday and indeed at very short notice in respect of the narrow period of time for publishing an amendment, an amendment that immediately sought to alter the UNCRC arisen because of research across government that highlighted a challenge in relation to a risk with regard to prosecutions. Now, I do not want to in any way be taken as undermining the importance of the discovery that the Scottish Government made at that stage. But the UNCRC has been around an incredibly long period of time, even if not in legislation. We have had reassurances of the ongoing work that's been done with regard to children and young people's rights. And yet it is only post stage two, a few days prior to a stage three debate, that a fundamental change has had to be put forward because of a challenge and a risk and a balance between two human rights, potentially the conflict of two human rights. And it disappoints me incredibly that in the, in the um, presentation that was given by the cabinet secretary, to quote, the amendments recognise the uncertain and far-reaching impact of the UNCRC requirements on decisions to prosecute. They, the amendment, strikes a fair proportionate balance between protecting victims, serving justice in the public interest and upholding the rights of children who are involved in criminal proceedings. In doing so, they afford the prosecutor an opportunity to remedy. That is a fundamental shift in who is taking the decision with regards to human rights and in particular young people's rights. It should be the responsibility of the court, not the executive in the widest sense, to take those decisions. I realise time is short and um, I seek your indulgence, Deputy Presiding Officer, because I want to finish with something which is a question in um, 
more than happy. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. I appreciate, and I do um, hear uh, Mr Whitfield's concerns um, ve very loudly, and I do uh, put, put that on record. But would he also recognise that it is imperative in holding up the rights of victims uh, who could be children that we have an appropriate mechanism for the court uh, to allow prosecutors one chance at a remedy to prevent uh, cases being deserted, which would not have been in the public interest. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that intervention. And of course, we are always challenged by the conflict in human rights between individuals, be it housing, be it healthcare, be it education, be it justice. We have a method of dealing with that which has been successfully used for over 20 years. And so, to finish, Deputy Presiding Officer, I place this question because I think it goes to the heart of the challenges that I find with this bill that's proposed today. We talk about the importance of care experience. We talk about the importance of children being around and at the table and being part of the discussions about these crucial things that happen. So I ask the government, how many children were involved in a consultation regarding taking away one of their rights? I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Around four minutes, please. We'll be voting for the bill this afternoon, stage three. We do have reservations and some of them that Martin Whitfield has eloquently set out. But I want to just, first of all, talk about what drives me with this piece of legislation. One was my visit to Polmont young offenders institution. It's basically a prison. The smell is overpowering. The doors are big, heavy. They've got big locks. The guards have got uniforms. It's no place for a child. And we should end that. I know there's only small numbers there now, but we should end that as quickly as possible. That experience was quite striking. The second one was just a few weeks ago when I met Care Experience children along with the Education Committee. They were frustrated, they're angry, they feel that not much has changed. They want the promise delivered and they want it delivered yesterday. So the urgency of my commitment when I was party leader to abide by the promise is also my third experience in this area. And that's why I'm going to vote for the bill uh, this afternoon, because I think we should have care, not prison. We should have hearings, not courts. And we should be treating children as children. Now, the reservations are clear. Martin Whitfield set out the process for getting there. I would rather have tested with other legal opinion about what Martin Whitfield is expressing, and I'm grateful that the Cabinet Secretary took time out to make the contributions yesterday to give us some kind of reassurance. Um, but, so I'm, I'm unhappy about that, and I think she knows that we're all unhappy about it, which is why I voted against those amendments yesterday. Um, I'm also concerned about the money, the shortage of money is throughout the system. It's already under pressure. The Minister was quite heavily criticised for the financial memorandum initially. Later on, it was improved. But we're also short of social workers, as Ros McCall has set out as well. So the system is under strain already, and we need to make sure that we have some resolution to that before we have this effective implementation. I've actually only got four minutes, if, if John Swinney doesn't mind. Um, my amendments are an important part of my contribution to this piece of legislation. The single point of contact for victim information to allow for information to be shared and safety planning purposes, very important for the, um, making sure that the provisions that are available in, in the children's hearing system are broadly the same as those in the adult criminal justice system. And because it extends to all children through the children's hearing system, it goes beyond the cohort of 16 and 17-year-olds. It goes beyond compulsory supervision orders and movement restriction conditions. So this is quite a significant step, and it's something the Minister wasn't in favour of at the start, but I'm grateful for the fact that she did move and that she was persuaded by her colleagues Stephanie Callaghan, Ruth Maguire, Michelle Thompson and others um, with their careful exercise of power, I must say, um, to make sure that the Minister did move and uh, negotiated with me to come up with what I think is a quite a satisfactory uh, solution, which is supported by Victims Support Scotland and the other organisations as well. It's also consistent with the Brandon principles, 
which is something I was very keen to adhere to. Um, just now, information sharing, only 14 per cent of uh, victims access that very limited information. We need to wrap that right up to make sure that we get many more people accessing the information that they need for safety planning purposes. So I'm really pleased that that went through, and I think it's an important piece of uh, law that will be forthcoming. But implementation is what it's all about. The Minister knows that. I hope she's got the commitments from our Cabinet colleagues uh, for financing this, because it will need a lot of money. It will need time. It will need sequencing. And everybody is watching. The social workers are watching. The children's hearing system are watching. But more important of all, the care experienced people are watching. There is great expectation that this will work and work effectively. And that's why the Minister needs to make sure that it does work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We will now move to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Russell Finlay. Ms McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to acknowledge the work of committee colleagues. Their willingness to work across party lines for the benefit of our young citizens was powerful and has brought about positive changes to legislation that will be meaningful to those we are here to serve. And again, as I did yesterday, I would like to acknowledge and thank the Minister for the distance that she travelled on the issues the committee raised and for listening generously and providing myself and colleagues with amendments to the Bill that helped achieve the changes that we wish to see. Sincere thanks also to all those who provided the committee with evidence, expertise and experience, but in particular victim support, Scottish Women's Aid, Assist and others who highlighted with clarity who we'd be letting down if we didn't think of all the children and young people, not just uh, those involved in the system because of their harmful behaviour. Um, one of the voices that ha has and will stay with me was that of the parents of those who had lost a child to murder and asked for anonymity for them. I'm sorry that this bill was not the place to get change. I do, however, want to welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to consult on the matter. I will not forget your voices and promise I'll do all I can to further your ask that the surviving siblings of murdered children can grow up free from the significant impact of continuing and traumatising press and social media coverage. The Care and Justice Scotland Bill will uphold the promise by improving outcomes for children and young people navigating care and justice, ensuring that children who come into contact with care and justice services or come into conflict with the law do so in an age-appropriate system and setting. The deprivation of liberty of a child should be the last resort, to be only used for the shortest period of time. It is true that children in secure accommodation and custody continue to be some of our most disadvantaged and excluded children in society. Many will often already have faced multiple adverse experiences, including abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, instability, community violence, deprivation, loss, bereavement, each of these things bringing the associated trauma. Many have significant mental health, emotional and well-being needs, which often are undiagnosed and they don't have the access to support they require. Where appropriate care and support is provided, this can encourage healthy development and improve current and future outcomes and opportunities to live a fulfilling life in the community. While secure accommodation in young offenders' institutions can both deprive children of liberty, the environments are distinctly different. Safe and trusting relationships are the cornerstone of promoting children's healthy development, but these are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to develop in a custodial environment, such as a Young Offenders Office, uh, Institute. Children should not be in prison. This bill ends the imprisonment of children in Scotland. Evidence, as well as common decency, shows us that children come into conflict with the law, that when children come into conflict with the law, Providing them with the best support to address the causes of their behaviour helps them to reintegrate, to rehabilitate and, importantly, to desist from harmful behaviour. This, in turn, prevents further harm in our communities. I think it is fair to say that the balance of this bill in terms of the rights of all children has been greatly improved through the committee process. We have significant improvements to information sharing provisions for victims within the bill. There's inclusion of provisions to provide support for victims in the children's hearing system, the establishment of a single point of contact service, and reporting duties which will ensure accountability and opportunity for scrutiny. This bill represents significant progress 
in realising children's rights. I will be proud to vote for it tonight, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Maguire. I call Russell Finlay to be followed by Michael Mara. Mr Finlay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Andrew was aged 14 when he was abducted and held in a disused building by four teenagers who he did not know. The gang tied him to a chair and bound his wrists. They struck him with a stick and pressed it against his throat. Andrew, which is not his real name, was ordered to apologise for his sexuality. And he was told that in Iran he would get his head cut off for being gay. His friend was told, you're next. And a container of flammable liquid in the room added to Andrew's distress. This terrifying ordeal was filmed and shared, and it only ended when the gang fled at the sound of sirens. This incident happened in the west of Scotland last June. Police Scotland, to their credit, apprehended the four suspects, and Andrew's parents were informed that they would appear in court. But this did not happen. The Crown Office decided that they would instead be referred to the children's reporter. Nobody told Andrew, nobody told his parents. They had no say. I wrote to the Lord Advocate, who conceded that this was, quote, clearly a serious offence, only it was not treated as such. After nine months, Andrew's parents were told that none of the suspects would even be subject to a panel hearing. They are deprived of basic information which they would have received had the case gone to court. Three months ago, Andrew was attacked again. He was beaten unconscious. The assailant fled but returned to film his handiwork. Andrew's parents have again been told that this act of sickening violence is also a matter for the children's reporter. And I cannot truly imagine the trauma suffered by Andrew, or the distress, the confusion, the helplessness, and even the rage of his parents. Now, the focus of this legislation is on the rights. I'm very sorry, I've only got four minutes. If I do have time, I'll come back to you. Thank you. The focus of this legislation is on the rights, interests, and welfare of young people in the criminal justice system. No one wants to unduly criminalise those who commit youthful misdeeds. And those who make false accusations about that do themselves a disservice. But I ask, and without apology, what about the rights, interests and welfare of victims? Victims like Andrew, who are often young people. The concepts of punishment and deterrence appear to have become alien. Excuses are made, no matter how heinous the crime, and mitigation often becomes justification. Criminal justice proceedings are then rebadged as welfare hearings. Now, opposition MSPs may pat themselves on the back today and applaud when this bill passes, but they should know that doing so will result in more cases like the one I have just described, children harmed by crime only to be further harmed by the system. Now, the SNP government needs to be honest with the public about this. Andrew's mother told me this morning, and I quote, this has consumed us. We cannot come to terms with how this is happening in Scotland in 2024. Serious crime is being downgraded. Andrew's parents wrote to the Lord Advocate and told her, and I quote, the clear message to us and to our son is that people can do what they want to him because he just doesn't matter enough. Well, Andrew does matter. And for him, for his family, many other voiceless victims, and for the other reasons set out today by my colleague, Ros McCall, and uh, Martin Whitfield, is why we will not vote for this legislation today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Michael Mara to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Mr Mara. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I've, I've had uh, the duty and, and, and the, uh, the, I would 
call it a pleasure in parts uh, of engaging with this bill uh, since its outset, uh, both through the Education Committee, the Finance Committee, and as others have done so far, I agree fully with the principle, core principle um, that is founded on that uh, children should not be in prison. I thought uh, Willie Rennie set that out very well and very eloquently. Um, I have to say I was also deeply affected by a visit I took with the uh, committee to Pullman. Um, it is a prison. There's no doubts um, about that. And it was the first time I'd ever been in a prison. And it met all the stereotypes of television, film uh, and literature as to what, um, as how terrifying, frankly, um, a place like that uh, can be, I have to say. Um, but I was also uh, deeply affected by a visit to a secure care centre. Um, and uh, I found that to be also be a very uh, moving uh, uh, experience, um, if a little different in part. But I would say that there are parts of that secure care sector that still have many of the characteristics uh, of imprisonment. The holding cell, for I feel that that's what I can call it little else, that arrivals, children arriving into that centre, some from as very far flung places across the UK, find themselves in. And I was moved to tears um, by seeing in that cell a children's child's duvet and a single teddy bear. And, and that juxtaposition and thinking, uh, coming upon me, the level of fear that a young person would feel and discomfort going into that place in these just very small comforts. This is no great transformation. I do believe it will be the, the right thing that children are not in the prison. But these settings are also incredibly challenging for young people. Um, and we have to uh, recognise that these centres, as other members have set out, have to be well resourced and supported appropriately. And we do have concerns that that has not been addressed sufficiently um, in the bill. Um, I've also, uh, throughout the course of, of the, uh, the, the bill, uh, raised the issue of cross-border placements. I did so again yesterday, moving my amendment. And I was disappointed that um, the government saw fit to vote against that, although I do think the minister set out some terms as to, to, to why that was, and I rec recognise those. So we have engaged in correspondence. We have had the ministers taking the time uh, to meet me. But in their briefing ahead of stage three, the promise stated that the existence of cross-border placements, and I quote, skews the landscape for Scotland so that there is a lack of strategic planning for children, meaning that children can be put in appropriate settings if demand has spiked. There is no accompanying evidence for that claim that I could identify. Indeed, the Education Committee has heard substantial evidence that it is precisely these cross-border placements that are ensuring the financial sustainability of the sector in Scotland. The rate paid for a child on a cross-border placement is higher than the Scottish Excel framework rate, meaning that the sector in Scotland is, to a very large extent, reliant on cross-border placements to keep the lights on. In the words of one secure care sector professional, without that income subsidy, no service for Scottish children would exist. And there was some, I think, progress in terms of the Minister's statement yesterday about judging these on a case-by-case -case basis. But the prevailing basis of that policy direction was expressed by the Promise and others. And it would indicate there is still that drive to take that number lower and lower. And I find it difficult to see, without, and we have not had assurances in this process, how the sector will not be exposed further as a result. And this, this sector is already grappling with extreme challenges um, in terms of, or significant challenges in terms of funding and resource. And a letter uh, provided to me this week by the, um, the secure care sector show that, in, despite the commitment from the Scottish Government in September of 2023 of delivering £12 an hour for the uh, workers in this sector, the government has failed to deliver on that assurance. So they have no ability to plan their finances for the year ahead at all because they've been told that they have to meet this and there's no, uh, there's no delivery of the funding and no clarity as to when it will actually happen. It's a very precarious situation and given this, where I started in this speech, President Officer, I don't think that's acceptable. Thank you, Mr Mara. And I now call Stephanie Callaghan. Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the Stage 3 debate as a member of the Education, Children and Young People Committee. And I'd also like to thank the committee clerks and witnesses for their input to the bill, the minister for engagement, and members of the committee for keeping their focus firmly on the rights of all the children impacted by this legislation. Presiding officer, my parliamentary window backs onto the Royal Mile Primary School. And listening to the pupils as they play is a lovely reminder of our duty. 
and that is to make Scotland the best possible place for our children to grow up. This bill is important. It supports children's rights in line with the principles of the UNCR and the ethos of getting it right for every child. And it is a step forward towards the Scottish Parliament's commitment to keeping the promise. Presiding officer, the journey to stage three has sometimes been challenging, but it signifies a big step in advancing children's rights in Scotland and fostering a justice system that truly serves our youth. Like others, I'm going to mention our committee visit to Poland Prison. It was painfully clear that such facilities are entirely unsuitable for children. These young individuals need comprehensive support for their well-being, not harmful environments that fail to meet their developmental and emotional needs. Presiding officer, I want to spend the rest of my time talking a bit about victims and safeguarding their rights. It is crucial to prioritise the fulfilment of children's rights, and that's whether they've caused harm or been harmed or both. And achieving this delicate balance has certainly been a focal point of our committee's scrutiny. And I do think this bill gets the balance right. Access to information is vital for victims, allowing them to plan for their safety and helping them to recover from traumatic experiences. I'm really grateful to Willie Rennie for working hard to reach agreement and bring forward his amendments that empower the principal reporter to share that information that's so critical for victims. What's more, these changes ensure that victims will have their ongoing access to information without the need for repeated requests, providing them with the consistent support that they deserve. Also, establishing that single point of contact will help children and young people access the information they need to safety plan more easily. It also meets the right to recovery, allowing them to reclaim their agency and make informed decisions and paving the way towards healing and justice. Presiding officer, it's imperative that we hold ourselves accountable. And I thank my colleague Ruth Maguire for her amendment, which places a duty in ministers to conduct thorough assessments of the services' effectiveness in collaboration with key agencies involved in the children's hearing system. By actively listening to the experiences of those who use the support services, we can genuinely ensure that we get it right for every child. Also, the advancement of victims' rights could not have been achieved without the tireless effort of stakeholders, such as Victim Support Scotland, Children's First, Children First, Scottish Women's Aid and our young people themselves. I am grateful for the engagement and unwavering advocacy to safeguarding victims throughout the journey of this bill. In closing, presiding officer, delivering for our children through this bill will have its challenges, and we have heard different views from across this chamber. But the dedication to placing children and young people at the forefront of our efforts has endured. I wholeheartedly stand behind this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Callaghan. And we now move to closing speeches. I call on Pam Duncan Clancy to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The intentions of the bill to improve the experiences and outcomes and strengthen the rights of children and young people and to stop putting children in prisons are ones that Scottish Labour wholeheartedly support, which is why we voted for this bill at stage one. But in considering a bill at stage three, we cannot be driven only by intentions, but also on the detail and its ability to deliver on them. It's not enough to stop locking children up. We have to give them a fighting chance at thriving in this world too, with all the scaffolding they need to do that. This bill does not yet include enough measures to guarantee it, and it is on that basis that Scottish Labour cannot support it today. Legislation drives action and resource. It provides leadership on what Parliament expects to be delivered, and in this case I believe we all expect that that includes child's rights, well-being, joined-up agency working, victims' rights, access to justice and fully supported workforce to deliver this. When the going gets tough on the front line, we all know in many ways it is right now, the letter of the law matters. President officer, I have seen too many good intentions and strategies and plans not delivered. The letter of the law matters, and I make no apology for working hard to make sure that it, this included all it needed to. During yesterday's debates on amendments to the bill and today's, members highlighted the importance of the Colbrandon principles, including Ruth Maguire and Willie Rennie and the Minister herself. They assert that the best interests of the child, well-being and support must be central to the system. But, sadly, attempts from MSPs across the Chamber to add to the bill mechanisms to do this were rejected. The failure to back amendments on training 
means that the frontline professionals delivering the new and nuanced support necessary to address the complex needs of children they work with is not there. The Bill does not go far enough to address Sheriff Mackey's recommendation that more must be done to uphold children and young people's rights to legal support, and this was another, another area the Government could have addressed by supporting one of my amendments yesterday. Without changes to ensure access to legal aid for all, the Bill falls short of UNCRC compliance. Anything short of automatic access is a dereliction of duty to abide by Article 40. The figures are clear that the current notification method is not working. My amendments could have addressed that. We are clear that every bill brought forward in this place that relates to children and young people should have rights compliance at its heart, and such a glaring omission to address compliance issues in this piece of legislation calls into question whether, we can, whether this government will deliver the UNCRC in relation to this itself. Lastly, I want to talk about the capacity needed to get this right. The whole system, social work, secure care, justice advocacy, and all of it, must be currently resourced for, in terms of staff. It must be better resourced in terms of staff, support and training. It does not yet have the capacity to deliver on the aims of the Bill, and many stakeholders have said it could set back progress. Social Work Scotland said on capacity that if there isn't enough, it will not achieve its purpose, risks placing further pressure and stress on already stretched workforce, impacts further on recruitment and retention, and the capacity to meet the goals of the promise. Had the Government listened to pleas from committee and stakeholders on the importance of sequencing, it would have addressed the Mackey's recommendations on the importance of consistency in panel members and chairs requiring more panel members before it brought the Bill forward. In not doing so, it has allowed capacity to become a concern. I attempted to try to safeguard this via amendments suggesting delaying the, the commencement of the legislation until um, support was in place, but they were voted down. There were multiple opportunities yesterday for, for the government to ensure capacity in the system was addressed, but the reality is they did not support them. That means we failed now, they failed, there is a failure now to guarantee training for all staff, leaving them with new duties without support to address them. They failed to include fully victim voice in hearings. They failed to plug gaps in legal aid, did not guarantee that there would be enough panel members, and did not put in provisions to address recruitment and concerns or support agencies to work together. And worst of all, I think, and this is the bit that I find most difficult, it did not make clear the UNCRC is the driver for it and missed an opportunity to make a provision for that in this bill as we brought amendments to um, And then the government brought an amendment, which we think, as Martin Whitfield outlined yesterday, that could undermine it. In light of these shortcomings, sadly, we can't support a bill that fails to give the care and justice system the legislative form, reform and capacity needed to deliver properly on the principles of it. So as we consider, presiding officer, in closing, what the future of Scotland's children might look like, let us remember their voices must be heard, their needs must be met and their rights upheld. It's incumbent on us to champion and do the right thing for those who struggle to be heard. The promises outlined in the Children's Hearings Review must not be neglected Ms. Duncan to Clancy, you will need to conclude, please. They demand concrete action. Let us instead prioritise wellbeing and children's rights. Thank, Thank you. you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Liam Kerr uh, to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. The principles of this bill are really important. What this bill seeks to do is absolutely key to delivering on the promise and our promises to young people. That's why this party, this parliament, voted for those principles at stage one. But as Ros, Mo Ros McCall succinctly put it, the issue isn't over the direction of travel. The issue is over the way we get there. Martin Whitfield put it in an article today. This is yet another well-intentioned bill that is incompatible with the situation on the ground. President officer, this government has a really concerning tendency to propose legislation which in its principles is laudable, yet in the execution is utterly unworkable, subject to legal challenge, or has unintended consequences. So, officer, I raised yesterday the removal of sections 12 and 13. I shan't rehearse the arguments, but what is key is that the stage one report missed the issue. At stage two, the minister reassured the committee she had no concerns at all when asked about restrictions on press freedom. I asked if she'd taken legal advice, and she reassured us she had on every section. Yet yesterday, she removed those sections, saying she'd been unaware how prejudicial the original drafting was, as basically no one told her. Now, leaving aside 
that what she's suggesting about the legal advice she was given and that surely the government is responsible for thinking through the consequences of what it drafts. It is a fair point. The first report missed the government had drafted a shocking and utterly unworkable clause, which the minister hadn't understood sufficiently to remove at stage two. Had it gone through, it would have likely contravened the ECHR and prevented the Act from operating. President officer, this afternoon, We've heard that huge concerns remain about this bill and its implications because it does not exist in a silo. Ros McCall said the Children's Hearing Panel needs to embark on a massive recruitment drive of volunteers. Hundreds more social workers are needed. We are in need of more foster carers. And she told us in powerful testimony of the current capacity of social services. Russell Finlay talked powerfully of the victim's view, picking up Victim Support Scotland's submission that people harmed by 16 or 17 year olds have had their rights removed to information and support. We heard evidence that social workers support the principles and want it to happen, like us, but they face a huge turnover of staff and this bill will pass with no more money leaving them to patch things together. The fact is, presiding officer, Years of SNP cuts to vital services mean many of the changes proposed in the bill will just be unable to be put into practice while Scotland's local authorities and social work departments struggle with cuts to services. Michael Mara said it's a precarious position. It's a point picked up by Pam Duncan Glancy. The finances are hugely important. I'm not convinced any of us have confidence they'll be forthcoming, but they're not even the sole concern. Pam has a worry, which I share. The system just doesn't have the capacity to do what the bill aims to do. And that will just put more stress on the workforce. But, President Officer, Martin Whitfield picked up a process point. He told us that substantive amendments around the UNCRC were brought forward at stage three. A fundamental change laid before this parliament because something, something else seems to have been missed at an earlier stage. And that really worries me. What else might have been missed, might have not been picked up by this minister? Presiding officer, this parliament is supportive of the principles of the Children, Care and Justice Bill. I think I speak for us all when I say we want those principles to be enacted. Stephanie Callaghan rightly reminded us we all want to make Scotland the best place for young people to grow up in. But member after member has warned this parliament at the end of a long, long process that they do not have confidence that this bill is drafted in such a way that, as an act, it will achieve that. The minister assures us at the start that the bill she proposes today shows what can be achieved with goodwill. But goodwill does not an effective and robust law make. Presiding officer, stakeholders and speakers have all made strong representations that effective and robust law is not what is presented here, which will, and it will not achieve the principles that we all want. In fact, the unintended and negative consequences may well be considerable. Accordingly, presiding officer, I will not vote for what I think will prove to be an unworkable, flawed bill that will ultimately let down those we all want to protect and it will fail to deliver the principles we all wanted. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I now call on the Minister to close on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. Now, this has proved to be a spirited and insightful debate, and I have no doubt that across the Chamber we have the best interests of Scotland's children at the forefront of our minds. It's fair to say, I think, that these issues we've debated and their effect on children's outcomes, on victims, on communities and on services elicit strong views from members. Some opinions expressed here relate to big picture fundamental principles and concepts, while others, I think, drill down into the important detail of delivery and regulatory systems. The diversity of the issues drawing that commentary reflects the scope, scale and the positive potential of this bill. Now, to come on, on some specifics raised this afternoon, I, I thank Ruth Maguire for her contribution and agree with her entirely that children should not be in prison. Now, many members have talked about their difficult experiences visiting Pullman. And while, of course, I know that concerns have been raised around raising the age of referral, I want to take a moment to emphasise how important I believe this step is. If a child does offend, 
We want to do everything that we can to ensure that that behaviour is not repeated. Rehabilitation is absolutely key, but we also need to remember that most children who commit an offence usually have welfare concerns too. Allowing all children to access the hearing system and equally secure care rather than young offenders' institutions will give our young people the most appropriate support to aid their rehabilitation, their reintegration and assistance, which should prevent future harmful behaviour. Now, I thank Ros McCall for her personal reflect reflections. And I agree with some of her sentiments around social work. In fact, to give a personal reflection, I had a social worker when I was 13 until I was about 16. She was fantastic. She helped me when I needed it the most. And as proof of how much she cared, I received a message on the day after the Scottish Parliament 21 election congratulating me on my election. And that was nearly 17 years after I had lost contact with her. So I absolutely understand, value and respect the work of social workers to the highest extent. Now, Scottish Government are taking action to improve the recruitment and retention and improve the experiences of social work. We have developed a joint workforce improvement plan, which is informed by the voices of social work and others. We have formed a joint social care and social work services task force to deliver improvements and for rural areas, a rural workforce recruitment strategy advisory group to look at these challenges in relation to remote and rural areas. And there is other work ongoing. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I, th I thank the Minister for taking the intervention um, and I'd like to put on record um, my, my thanks to her for sharing her personal experience um, too, which I think is really important for all of us. Um, in, in regards to the point about the workforce, um, can, can the Minister set out when they'll publish the plan for the workforce and social work? Minister. I don't have that detail to hand, but I'm happy to get back to the member when I, when I do. In terms of the finances, as I advised in my opening speech, these have been updated and that has been in conjunction with delivery partners. And this will continue to be monitored as we look towards implementation and costs will be factored into government budget profiling in the normal manner for any piece of legislation. Now, in relation to Russell Findlay's um, contribution, I am, I am so sorry to, to hear of that specific case. Now, Mr Finlay asked about the rights of victims, and I would re-emphasise that the changes in this bill will strengthen those rights. I have heard loud and clear the concerns from both stakeholders and committee members in relation to victim support and rights, and I will emphasise again, this government is committed to supporting victims, no matter which system deals with an offence case. I believe that the single point of contact and the other actions we have taken throughout the process of this bill will, will help with that. Now, Ruth Maguire also raised issues around anonymity. And I want to be clear that I have every sympathy for the loss suffered by families who have experienced the loss of a child. I'm following a roundtable with MSPs and stakeholders and meeting with bereaved families the Cabinet Secretary is now considering how a consultation can be framed and the timescales for its publication this year. So, as Ms Maguire noted, this, is, this bill is not the space for that, but there is ongoing work in that space. In terms of capacity, another issue which members have raised. Capacity building and system readiness are absolutely key. We have convened a resourcing and implementation group with over 30 delivery agencies. And this group has met three times in 2023 and again most recently in February. This group and other engagement will help us continue to assess the most current cost forecasts and factor those into Scottish Government budget profiles for the coming years. Now, while the bill is likely to introduce more hearings, the number of hearings currently held is significantly lower than its peak, and these reforms will not take hearing numbers anywhere near back to the previous levels. In terms of panel numbers specifically, and I touched on this yesterday, we cannot rely on overall panel numbers to assess system readiness. They offer no useful guide to Parliament. In some areas, some volunteers are able to dedicate more time than others. I have trust in our group, our implementation group, who are working on this, working on the capacity and system readiness to take this forward. Now, I'm really 
I'm really disappointed, actually, to hear that the Conservatives and Labour will not be voting for this. And it really, really does make me question those parties' commitment to the promise. Now, in closing... The, the, minister, the minister must conclude. In closing, I would like again to thank Parliament for the diligent scrutiny this legislation has undergone. I thank members of the Finance Committee, the Criminal Justice Committee and the Education Committee. The diligent scrutiny of the Bill by committee members and others has helped, as it should, to shape the final form of the Bill. I thank the committee clerks who have worked so hard to support the work of the committees, as well as those who have supported members in scrutinising and improving the Bill. And finally, I would like to thank my excellent officials for working so hard on what has been a demanding and challenging piece of legislation and introducing this to what, at the time, was a new minister who had little experience in some of these areas. The Scottish Government is clear that the Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill makes significant and necessary improvements to further embed the UNCRC and to keep the promise. I commend this bill to Parliament and encourage members across the Chamber to support it. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill at Stage 3. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. And the question is that motion 12944 in the name of Natalie Don on Children, Care and Justice Scotland Bill be agreed. And as this is a motion to pass the bill at stage three, the question must be decided by division. So there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.